it's cooking up. Okay, we are live on YouTube. We're going to give it a couple of minutes to attract some viewers. And, um, and then I'm going to introduce you. Okay, we've got, we've got one viewer on YouTube. So we'll, we'll start and, uh, and proceed. So, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this I'm Skip Conover, and I'm uh, the founder of the Carl Jung Depth Psychology Reading Group on YouTube. And today, I have the honor to introduce Matthew Legg, who is the Peace Program Coordinator for the Canadian Friends Service Committee, and. Matthew has written a book and uh, created a program uh, called uh, Are We Done Fighting Yet? Uh, building up, building understanding in a world of hate and division. And I know that that's a concern with many of us. Uh, and so uh, it seemed like an important topic for us to undertake today. And so, Matthew, I'm going to turn the floor over to you and uh, we'll ask you some questions. Uh, do you want questions at the end or during yeah. the process? Okay, we'll- I think I'll, I'll speak for a little bit and then we'll do questions at the end. Okay, terrific, that'll work well. And we'll also have uh, questions from the YouTube audience. Uh, we now have five watching on YouTube and a new one is arriving here in Zoom, so we'll probably have some people arriving uh, for the next couple of minutes. Um, but um, we'll go ahead. Uh, welcome, right. Eleonora. Thank you, Skip. So I hope um, you can see this image of an empty chair. Yes, we and, can. And um, since we're talking about issues that impact on a lot of people and uh, only a few people are able to be on a call like this to talk about them, I like to start off with an empty chair um, so that we can kind of reflect on who might be sitting in that chair, maybe somebody um, with whom you strongly disagree on something um, and try to try to imagine that, that they were here as well um, participating in this because I find personally one of the easiest things for me to do um, is to criticize people who aren't in the room. So, so I do like to try to bring those people into the room, at least symbolically, so that they're, that they're here with us as I go through this presentation. Okay, so this is Karen Ridd. She's a university professor, a mother, and she lives in Winnipeg, Canada. In 1989, uh, human rights defenders in El Salvador were um, under serious threat of assassination and many were being killed. And they called out for help and solidarity from the international community. Karen was one of many people who responded. She went as a volunteer unarmed civilian to accompany Salvadoran human rights defenders. She was part of a group of internationals whose presence helped to keep these people safe as they did their daily work. At some point, the volunteers were proving too much of a nuisance um, and frustration and the military came and arrested Karen and three others. She recalls, I was blindfolded, handcuffed, interrogated, kept standing without food and water, and threatened with rape and mutilation. Karen had been taken to a torture center. Everyday Canadians heard about Karen's plight and called and faxed their members of parliament and the Salvadoran government. The pressure began to work. The president of El Salvador himself called the jail twice. The jail guards felt that pressure and decided to release Karen. She refused. Another volunteer 
Marcelo Rodriguez Diaz from Colombia was in the same detention center with Karen. And she said she wouldn't go unless they were both set free. The guards, their questions laced with sexual innuendo challenged her. Do you miss us, they asked? Do you want us? Karen's next choice was remarkable. In this life or death situation, where she was speaking with apparently ruthless torturers, she put them in a bind. Karen said, no, of course I don't wanna be here, but you're soldiers. You know what solidarity is. You know that if a comrade is down or fallen in battle, you wouldn't leave them. And I can't leave my comrade. You understand. Now this created a dilemma for the guards. Agreeing with Karen meant that they would be acknowledging that they were similar to her, reducing the distance and the power differentials between them. But disagreeing would be shameful admitting that they didn't care about their own comrade and would only protect themselves. The guards went silent. Then after a long while, one of them said, yes, we know why you're here. I had found a connection, a shared space of humanity in which the threat of violence could be confronted without alienating those involved. The guards let both Karen and her colleague Marcella go. Karen Ridd, with no guarantee of success and with her life on the line, had found a way to connect even to torturers. Imagine for a moment what it would feel like to have the skills to positively transform dysfunction and violence like Karen Ridd did. That's powerful. Karen didn't get these skills out of thin air. She practiced, she role-played, she studied. In my job, I've come across a surprising number of people who are like Karen and whose stories, because they don't involve bombs going off but preventing bombs from going off, don't tend to get our attention and get told to the same degree. So I got curious, what can I learn from folks like Karen? But let me take a step back and answer the question first of who am I? So uh, I work for Canadian Friends Service Committee, which is the National Peace and Social Justice Agency of Quakers in Canada. And we were founded back in 1931. We have three areas of focus, Indigenous people's human rights, peace and criminal justice. And I know from all kinds of different Quakers that I've had the chance to meet and talk to um, over the years that I've been here that there are some really amazing stories. And I must say that Quakers are also generally pretty bad at sharing them. Um, maybe they're a little too humble. Um, maybe they just don't know how to use communication channels very well, but um, I've been really inspired in part to hear a bunch of these stories and also to be able to collect them and share them and also analyze what's going on there. So, um, depending on what country you're in, you may have seen a picture of a guy who's dressed kind of like this on your breakfast cereal. Um, and that's probably what the only thing that most people know about Quakers if they know anything about Quakers. So I thought I'd just, it's not the main focus of my presentation, but I'll just say a few words about Quakers just so you're aware. Um, so this is supposed to be an image of George Fox, the founder of Quakerism. And a few years ago, some um, Quakers from different countries turned it into a meme. So there's a whole bunch of these different memes called Quaker problems, and they're, they're pretty funny. Um, this one is making light of the fact that people often are confused about who Quakers are and think that they ride on a horse and buggy or continue to dress like George Fox did here in the 1650s. And that's not the case. Um, it's not the focus. Of, yeah, so uh, firstly, and very centrally, I'd mentioned that Quakers believe that we each possess a measure of the light or spirit or what some call that of God within us. So Fox encouraged a turn away from what he saw as the more ornate and hollow and outwardly focused rituals of some of the churches of his day. And he felt that there was no need for ordained priests, which was a very radical departure. Instead, he believed that sitting together with others Beginning in silence, um, people could turn within and listen for the divine. 
This may then lead someone in the group to speak the piece of truth that has been revealed to them. And this is different from just saying their opinion. So several things are important here. Um, one is that each of us has access to what you could call your higher self or the divine or that of God. And that doesn't need to be mediated by any external authority. Another uh, important thing is trying to discern the truth that you can connect with in the silence. So there's a great importance placed on this deep spiritual listening and sometimes patiently doing so over long periods of time. Also for Fox, the truth could be uncovered together in community, um, beginning in this silence. So this is then extended to business meetings. So decisions aren't reached by a simple vote, but by searching for what's called unity or a sense of the meeting, a feeling of deep stillness together, where if it's working well, everyone has put all of, their, uh, all of themselves into the group. They've brought everything they have and they've put their individual agendas and their egos aside and they're really working together to listen for and discern um, the way forward. And an important and related concept is that of continuing revelation. So, the way continues to open as people traverse it, and they must continue to seek after the truth. It's not just um, what was written in the Bible will be valid for all spiritual seekers. Everyone has to do their own inner work and continue to listen and seek for that way. Um, and there's also a lot of differences of experience because of that. So if you ask a Canadian Quaker, you'll get all kinds of very different responses about what happens for them in the silence. And from these early friends, a few important points of commonality began to emerge, and those continue to inform our work today at Canadian Friends Service Committee. So um, the Quaker testimonies are um, simplicity, um, so if you believe the things that I just mentioned, you have to listen for the divine and try to follow its patterns. So um, you have to live simply in order to be able to do that. So this is way before Mary Kondo was talking about it, but basically the idea of clearing out what isn't serving life uh, so that you can focus and be present to your deeper connection with life. Um, if you believe in what I was just talking about, then you believe that there is that of God in everyone. So many Quakers feel that killing becomes, it's just off the table. And so they support peace. You have to speak and follow the divine truth inside you and to share it with your community. So in order to do that, you have to conduct yourself with integrity. The community uh, aspect I've already touched on, the idea that no one charismatic leader should completely take over. Power needs to be shared between people. Equality. So People have unique skills and interests, of course, not everyone's exactly the same, but ultimately there's no um, chosen people or chosen group that should be considered better than other people. Um, there shouldn't be one race or one sex dominating any other um, because we each have that of God within. And unity with creation. So not placing the needs of humankind above or in competition with those of other species or ecosystems trying to be in unity. So to summarize all that I just said, basically um, the promptings of love and truth in our hearts are the source of our commitments at CFSC to human rights, to justice and to peace. So that's where I'm coming from. But just in case anyone gets nervous, um, I'm not an extremist and this book is not full of complaints or calls to just be reasonable or all just be friends. Um, it's written with the secular skeptic in mind, very much so, and I want to interrogate common Quaker ideas and test them against the best evidence I could find. I wanted to honestly discuss and test out what's realistically possible. So um, just so everyone knows, this is from The Onion. It's a fake headline. Um, so for the past few years, I've been reviewing thousands of findings from different fields like social psychology, behavioral economics, and neuroscience. And at some point, this was a picture of the inside of my brain. I spend a lot of time looking into the very worst things that people do, as well as the very best. And I learned that there are limitations with all of the academic studies I was reading. 
such as many of them having only been done in one or a few cultures, um, not having been replicated. And so I did include a lot of these studies in the book, but I also included a lot of real world stories like Karen Ridd's because I think it's important to share the best evidence we can find rather than just relying on what turns out to often be somewhat inaccurate or totally false common sense. Um, so I was surprised by a lot of the things that I learned in the course of researching for this book and not always happily surprised, but I shared what I found. And my opinions on many topics did change significantly over the course of researching this. So for me personally, it was a really powerful learning and development experience. And now I'm thrilled that I survived it, all the editing's done, it's out there in the world. And I'm um, helping to facilitate workshops using activities from the book. And I also should say that my name is on it, but this was really a community effort. And these aren't just my original ideas. I'm extremely fortunate to work with a bunch of wonderful people who, um, many of whom are volunteers who helped to make this happen. So I'm excited to share just a few really interesting things that I discovered along the way. So here's an important question. What is the one principal cause of polarization? I bet each of us has our own analysis of what's happening in the world right now and what are the key drivers of hate and social division. Perhaps you think it's a spiritual crisis, an alienation from the natural world or from the divine, maybe a fundamental confusion of identity or too much identification with the masculine or the ego. Maybe you'd point to something about human evolution, human nature, our media, our education system, our economic system. Maybe you think uh, that we have too much individualistic um, impulse and it's fracturing our societies. Maybe you think we've become too sensitive. Maybe there's a lack of shared values or shared identities. In the US in particular, but it's certainly not alone, the Pew Research Center has been saying for years that there's a rising tide of mutual antipathy. Um, people just feel worse about those on the other side. So um, this is actually a bit of a trick question though. Psychologist Peter Coleman did a literature review and he found that a number of different authors were each proposing the one principal cause of entrenched violent conflicts. When he added these up, he found that there were actually 57 principal causes. And I think that's the reality of our world. I don't think that's wrong. Uh, it's just, it's overly simplistic to think that there could be one cause for something. So um, in reality, there are complex and emergent systems that are these deeply entrenched conflicts and countless factors are involved and each factor is influencing every other factor. So there isn't a simple linear path to define what's happening or what's gonna happen next or how to fix it. And that means that we wind up here in the woods and I'd invite you to join me. So there's a whole ecosystem of issues before us. And I do have a general plan, but the book covers all sorts of interrelated topics. Many paths wind around and connect up in the end. So I propose to just talk about a few areas that I think are particularly interesting, highly relevant, and not overly covered already, not obvious. Um, and I'm happy to take questions at the end so we can get to any of the other parts of the woods that we didn't have the chance to explore if you want. So let's put our detective hats on and let's start pondering this complex mystery of what's going on with this societal polarization. And I know that everyone's mind went to the same place. I'm really good at predicting this. It's always Framingham, Massachusetts. It's a town of 67,000 people. This is a picture. Um, since 1948, researchers have been collecting an incredible amount of data from thousands of volunteers in Framingham. In 2008, a team decided to dig into all of this information about the health, the emotional well being, and the social networks of 4,739 residents of Framingham. Exploring what each person was doing and who they were connected to over a 30 year period led to a really remarkable discovery. So 
That's you. The complex web of relationships in Framingham demonstrates that if your friend over here becomes happier, you become happier. If a friend of your friend becomes happier, you become happier. And most amazingly, if a friend of a friend of your friend, someone you've probably never even met, becomes happier, that has a significant influence on your happiness. Now, the effect sizes here are small, and they get smaller at each um, degree of uh, different uh, distance from you, but they're there, they're present. So happiness is seems to be moving between people. And in order to see for sure that that was true, the researchers made sure that they were not just looking at um, ha already happy people going out and befriending other happy people. And because they were collecting data from the same individuals over time, they could rule that out. This wasn't that. It was actually happiness spreading between people like a virus. Of course, it's not only happiness that spreads this way. So one research study discovered that certain specific forms of depression where pessimistic thought patterns play, play a major role can hang around college dorm rooms year after year, even when the people who initially brought them into the dorm have already graduated. So um, the researchers said that this was like a lingering flu. It's also been shown that decisions can spread, for instance, whether or not, whether or not to become an organ donor. Aggression can spread. One study found that people playing violent video games were spreading that, were becoming more aggressive and then spreading that aggression to other people in their networks, friends of theirs who never played violent video games. Matthew Jackson, who studies networks, shares in his book, The Human Network, taking advantage of various forms of randomization, either by chance or by researchers, there are now many examples where we see people being influenced by the decisions and experiences of those around them, from whether Harvard Business School graduates choose to become entrepreneurs based on classmates' experiences, to which apps people adopt, to whether people enroll in a retirement plan, to whether people exercise, to which stocks people buy and sell. A major study done on Facebook users found that rainfall directly influences the emotional content of their status messages. And it also affects the status messages of their friends in other cities who are not experiencing rainfall. In other words, the researchers said that social media may magnify the intensity of global emotional synchrony. Now, of, co of course, it's not necessarily global because who do we tend to synchronize with? The decisions of a few companies are impacting the information that most of the world accesses today. That's actually staggering if you think about it. They make money from your attention and from your data. They've designed their platforms to keep you on them as long as possible. And one way to do that is to present you with what you want to see based on data the companies have about you. And that's a filter bubble. It means that you're systematically fed information that seems to show you that the world is as you imagine it and want it to be. We really like bubbles. We try to put ourselves in them. Neuroscience has found that getting the information we want to hear is pleasurable and being challenged can be anything but. So we're biased towards looking for information that confirms what we already want to believe. Studies show that we may even forego money in order to only read articles that seem to confirm our beliefs. Consider too that organizations in uh, dozens of countries now, I think it's over 70 at the last count that I saw, have been exposed running social media manipulation campaigns to attempt to sway public opinion. So they're um, using bots and memes and other ways to try to make an idea seem popular when it actually may not be. And um, the repetition of messages over and over such that they seem to be reality is some people's definition of propaganda. So there's a, there's a free chapter of the book um, on the website, arewedonefighting.com that anyone can download. And that shares a bunch of fascinating research about how we come to believe things and why changing our mind can be so difficult. Um, but one important point that's raised is this. 
When we say we know something, what do we mean? Almost always, we mean that we trust someone else who's come up with that idea or who has told us that fact, not that we're uh, speaking from personal detailed research or from our own experience. So some of us are thinking, so what? This doesn't surprise me. But if you stop to think about it further, much of what I've just said goes against some very fundamental ideas that we have about ourselves and that get repeated a lot. That we're our own individuals, that we generally make rational and well-informed choices, that the happiness of the friends of the friends of our friends has nothing to do with us. Current research is breaking down the idea of an isolated, static individual making consistent and measured choices. Instead, more and more of what scientists are learning shows our interdependence and our malleability. I think the COVID-19 pandemic has driven home just how connected our world is and how security must be shared security. It can't be just for some individuals. Many of our ideas about ourselves can make us a bit pessimistic, a bit fatalistic, quite certain that brutality is natural and unavoidable, that cruelty is encoded in our DNA, that you can't teach an old dog new tricks. I consider all of those ideas and more in the book, and I find some bits of support, but more often um, metaphors and assumptions rather than solid evidence are underlying those ideas. One area that I was particularly fascinated to learn more about is um, neuroplasticity. So neuroscience is finding out more and more about how use changes the brain. As many of us have heard over enough repetitions, neurons that fire together in time will physically wire together. Also neurons that we don't use get pruned away and connections break down as new connections form. So neuroscientist Rick Hansen explains, what flows through your mind sculpts your brain. Immaterial experience leaves material traces behind. In one experiment, a group spent three months learning to juggle. And um, in a functional magnetic resonance imaging scan, um, you could actually see in their brains telltale changes. So you could measure physical changes in the brain because of increased density of neural networks after this three months of learning to juggle. Then they were told don't juggle for the next three months and scans afterward showed that um, the size of those areas had reduced again. So in other words, neuroscience is finding that where you place your attention is very powerful. With enough repetitions, you'll change your brain to some degree. And it's also a constant process. So the takeaway here is use your attention with care. Okay, a study found that people on university campuses are significantly more likely to donate when the pitch included four simple words at the end. What do you think they were? I'm a student too. We have sympathy for people who are like us. Feeling like we're part of a group is very, very important. Groups provide us with safety, a sense of belonging, and they give us meaning in our lives. They give us people we can trust. But this can lead to catastrophic consequences when we feel like others aren't part of our group. That's the process called othering. And importantly, it doesn't depend on any particular characteristic of the other. So for instance, randomly dividing coworkers into teams can lead us to very quickly generate negative feelings for members of another team, even if they're of the same race as us, while members of our team are not of the same race. So race, a type of grouping we've learned from childhood is suddenly less powerful of a divider than other team member an arbitrary division created a few moments ago. And in particular studies find both um, neuroscience studies and studies of people's reported beliefs find that when we're given information that helps us see people as unique individuals and not just as representatives of their group, that can greatly reduce uh, bias and prejudice. A takeaway from all this 
is that how we frame issues and how we set up situations can polarize them or can help our thinking to remain more helpful and creative. And we'll return to that. Research in children suggests that othering can start very young. Even preschoolers think it's less immoral to harm members of another group than to harm members of their own group. But children with overtly racist parents don't seem to pick up the idea that race defines something about a child's character until around age six. And that's an area of ongoing study. The book has a lot more information about the issue of othering and specific tips to address it, but I'll just touch on a few interesting findings about one important dimension. Um, some of the reasons that we may feel threatened by people who we don't see as part of our group. So a topic that's been a major election question in various countries and has been particularly polarizing is the treatment of refugees. So studies have looked at characteristics of folks who are more open to accepting refugees into their country. And these people tend to show fewer physical signs of distress in situations of uncertainty. So they won't sweat or tense up as much if they see um, a picture of an unflushed toilet, for example. Um, so they don't show as much disgust, as much um, distress in situations of uncertainty or when confronted by um, unpleasant stimuli. However, studies have also found that making these folks feel afraid while they're in the lab can change their views. So they become more interested in safety and security and temporarily less accepting of refugees. And there's also studies looking at real world trauma that find the same thing. So if we have a traumatic event, some of us will become um, less open to something like accepting refugees and more readily see situations around us as threatening. And the opposite has also been found. So in the lab, if you bring people in who are not very supportive of refugees, and then you say, imagine that you have a superpower that gives you invincibility and makes you totally safe and secure. Temporarily, those folks then start showing more support for an acceptance of refugees into their countries. So I think this tells us a few interesting things. Many studies are suggesting that perception of um, threat and disgust um, that others could get us sick or that we need to stay away from them because they're somehow dangerous um, are ancient defense mechanisms that some of us are more acutely attuned to. And we may be prone to feeling threatened and disgusted by people who don't pose any threat to our well being. And we're also quite vulnerable to messages from elites. So if traditional or social media sources or politicians are framing issues in these ways, especially dehumanizing people, um, that can powerfully influence a lot of individuals to support that kind of messaging. On the other hand, we may also not be threatened enough, which could be dangerous too. So for example, folks who are too open to change might accept new technologies before considering possible health risks negative social consequences or other serious drawbacks where conserving traditions might have been more beneficial. So ideally, this research would give us a bit more cause for understanding those whose views are different from our own and seeing some value in considering them at least up to a point. It could be that they have an important insight to offer us. So I'll just recap what I've said so far. Um, we are much more malleable and continually changing than we might um, believe. Um, we are greatly affected by situations, much more than we might imagine. And perception of others as safety or threat is really a central feature of a lot of polarizing um, issues right now. What I found really fascinating was to learn that it can be the moments when we ourselves feel unsure about a belief that we're most aggressive in defending it to other people. So what's going on with that? A lot of this seems to be about identity. So again, it's important to feel like we're a part of a group, even if uh, even in very specific groups. So um, for instance, there's an online community of adult men who love the children's cartoon, My Little Pony. Um, and even in a group like that, there is a mainstream of what's acceptable 
and there are certain ideas and norms that are pushed to the margins. Any group has to have a mainstream and it has to have margins because in order to have a group, you need to have some basis for common identity, for seeing yourselves as a group. Um, so something has to be normal and acceptable and that by definition means something else is not as normal or acceptable. And it can be really, really costful and stressful and um, uncertain to feel like you're being pushed to the margins or that you're on the margins. You're pushed out of the safety and privileges of the mainstream. So it seems that most of us are more concerned about feeling that our beliefs will keep us in good standing with the group that will be in the mainstream versus being honest. Famous studies have shown that most people will go along with decisions that they know are, are factually wrong as long as the rest of the group is unanimous. There's good evidence that that's happening right now uh, in all kinds of different groups. So when you ask people one-on-one, -on -one, whether it be folks in prisons, teachers, all kinds of groups, folks were saying that norms within their groups were actually too strict and weren't working for them. So it was something that was bad for them and they were also strictly enforcing it, even though it didn't benefit them to do so. So oftentimes if we have doubts about what our group is doing, we'll just keep quiet. And we'll also assume that everyone else is in agreement with what's happening, even though maybe no one is in agreement or very few people are. So now we're in a tough conversation with someone. This is where it really happens. Um, let's say we're talking about an issue like the death penalty. Um, do you think that in order to change your mind from whatever you believe about the death penalty, that person would have to present you with really clear evidence? Most people tend to say yes when I ask this question. And um, unfortunately, research finds that when we're presented with information that counters the beliefs that are important to our identities, very often we just believe more firmly. According to one study, um, we're likely to show brain activity associated with rumination and with reflection on who we are as people. And those of us who show the most of this kind of threatened and ruminating response are also the most likely to hold fast to what we currently believe. As researcher Jonas Kaplan puts it, when we feel threatened, anxious, or emotional, then we're less likely to change our minds. And I think that sounds kind of obvious when you hear it said like that, but um, we regularly ignore this when we're trying to engage in difficult conversations. Piles of evidence that I found all suggested that information, especially when it's presented in an aggressive debate format or in a way where it could shame the other person publicly for admitting that they were wrong, very rarely leads to um, behavioral or um, belief change. I'm not saying never, but information can be important, but still broadly speaking, debating isn't gonna be the most useful way to address inaccurate or hateful beliefs. In fact, and this was really interesting to me, um, studies show that folks across the political spectrum reject inconvenient evidence in very similar ways. So this is not a problem of left or right. Um, if you divide people up at random in a study, and there have been a number of these done, uh, that show them the exact same data from a made up um, experiment, and then ask them to respond to that data, um, if they like the conclusion that that data came to, they say the experiment was very well done. And if they don't like the conclusion, they say that exact same data, that exact same fake experiment data um, has all kinds of flaws with it and should be rejected. So I think that's what most of us do. We're really good at rejecting ideas and evidence that we dislike. And we don't hold evidence that we do like to the same standards of scrutiny. We spontaneously invent stories that seem to justify our actions. We unconsciously look for information that seems to confirm what we already believe. And we also label people who see things differently, sometimes even believing that they're less than human. So how can we use this knowledge to have the best chance of being heard by someone who strongly disagrees with us? Firstly, I wanna point out that these tips are meant for a real conversation 
And um, sometimes today, unfortunately, a lot of times today, that's not what's actually happening. So someone could just be trolling if it's happening online in particular, and you don't know the person. Um, maybe they're just looking for a reaction and they're not actually trying to have a conversation, in which case it may not be worth your time to engage. But let's say, for example, that you're talking to a coworker or to a family member and you're troubled to hear them start expressing Islamophobic views. You don't need to get into a debate about what the Quran actually says. That's not likely your best approach. So what does work? Well, one study tested a whole bunch of different options. Um, they showed people a range of different educational video clips, humorous video clips like uh, the comedian John Oliver explaining why equating Islam and terrorism is irrational and harmful. And the clip, in my opinion, is factually accurate, and I thought it was pretty funny. Um, it did absolutely nothing to reduce people's levels of misunderstanding of Islam or of blaming all Muslims for bombings carried out at the time by Daesh. So what does work? The study did identify one strategy that worked, and this is really important. It's actually useful not just for addressing Islamophobia, but for any hateful or inaccurate view whatsoever. And it's a tip that you can put into practice um, right away. In fact, you can even use it on yourself, which, is, which I have been doing, and it's, it's great. Um, but I want to pause to explain the dynamics behind it before I share it. So this is Megan Phelps Roper. She grew up in a hateful family. From the age of five, she would go to protests and hold signs explaining how much God hates Jews and gay people. Um, Megan had a complete turnaround and gave up her hateful life. That meant she had to totally change her identity. Imagine how difficult that is. She even had to accept being shunned by her family, cast out of the safety of her group. So how did this painful and powerful transformation happen? The answer, of course, is that bastion of clear communication and peace building, Twitter. It's true. Um, some people on Twitter began engaging with her respectfully and with genuine curiosity. This approach recognizes that the other person can't be pushed along or rushed or forced to change. They have to go through a process of uncovering the truth in their own heart. The curiosity that people engaged her with was asking, how did you come to believe this? Rather than prescribing, you should believe something else. Curiosity must include genuine listening. We often get mixed up and we think that listening to people means giving in or conceding something. And that's just not true. Listening with curiosity does not mean agreeing and it doesn't mean conceding anything. Um, in reflecting back on her prior life, Megan explained that anyone who had insulted her um, was very easy for her to reject because she knew that she was a righteous outsider fighting for what was good and moral, and um, no one else saw or understood the world the way that she did. So in other words, her group's intentions were good, and um, everyone who attacked her was just proving her own belief correct. Um, but she started to come across these people who were more respectful to her. And then she had to realize that, hey, these people aren't all monsters like I thought they are. And when she had to accept that, then she had to accept that her group wasn't just so good as she thought it was. The world was much messier. And I came across a lot of stories similar to Megan's again and again from former violent extremists and hate group members. Their identities are wrapped up in the idea of being the only ones brave enough to speak the truth. Uh, and so it, the really important thing to remember from this is, is Megan's point that um, we all believe that we're fighting for the right cause. One study looked at the levels of support that various people have for the US bombing Syria. The finding was surprising. You might expect that which political party people voted for or their level of religious faith 
would predict how supportive they would be of going to war. But there was actually a better predictor. Their level of agreement with the statement, some people are evil. That's a classic example of simple binary logic. Either you're good or you're evil. Either you're with us or you're against us. Either or. The difficult conversations lab at Columbia University, which is this, this picture is from there, um, has done research that helps explain this further. Folks who have strongly opposing views for and against abortion, for example, are brought together for a long one-on-one -on -one conversation. As you might imagine, some of those conversations go really badly. But some of them go surprisingly well. And people after uh, an hour in the lab leave saying, you know what, I don't agree with that person, but that was really worth my time to, to engage with them. What do you think the difference is between those different types of conversations? Well, what the lab has found is that some people tend to descend into a negative um, emotional state and stay there. They just get entrenched. Whereas some of them have more complex interactions. So they are both feeling challenged by what the other side is saying and feeling genuine warmth for them. They are both strongly disagreeing with the points being made and thinking about them and becoming curious. So it's a richer fluctuation of experience. The power of our emotions and our convictions and our sense of identity can trap us in binary tunnel vision very easily. But we can also come to see the other side as just as human as us. We can break free from the idea that the only option is a so-called zero-sum game where we, we win when they lose. And we can look for ways to move forward together. Remember Karen Ridd's story again. She didn't agree with the torturers in El Salvador and she didn't have to compromise her values. In order to establish a human connection with them, she also did not dehumanize them to a simple other of you're just evil. We can both have trying moments of profound disagreement and keep recalling places of commonality. We can both feel challenged and feel that the other side is a full human being that we're curious about and want to know where they're coming from and how they got there. Both and, not either or, that's complexity. And the great news is that this skill of complex thinking can be learned. Some programs are even reporting successes in teaching it to former members of violent extremist groups. Here's a quote from Quaker author Parker Palmer. He's hinting at the rich wholeness of the complex relationships we're all wrapped up in. As we've started to see, anytime someone is influencing us or we're influencing them, that's a relationship. Matt, I wonder if you could read that because uh, I can't really see it. Sure, yeah. It says, for all the power it has given us in science and technology, either or thinking has also given us a fragmented sense of reality that destroys the wholeness and wonder of life. So here's a question. Why do people who care more about fairness cheat more on tests? That, that's a real finding. Studies have been done in countries from China to Turkey to Italy to Canada, and it's been found that most of us will cheat on tests a little bit. But we won't cheat as much as we can possibly get away with. Even when uh, we are getting paid $4 per um, answer that we claim to have gotten right, we pay ourselves out of a bowl of cash, and then we shred the test paper so no one could possibly know that we cheated. So that's pretty interesting. And another interesting finding is, is this one, that the folks who say that they care the most about fairness often cheat more on the tests. So what's going on? Well, recall that we all think we're fighting for the right cause. So if I particularly care about fairness, I can tell myself a story that says, I deserve to cheat because I didn't sleep well last night 
and uh, it's not fair that I'm having to take the test right now when usually I would get a few more questions right, I would be mentally sharper. So I would usually get about four more questions right. So it's only fair if I um, say that I got those four right and pay myself. So I didn't cheat as much as I possibly could. Um, so that means that that story allowed me to both um, think that I'm a good person, think that I care a lot about fairness and I'm doing a fair thing, and I get to cheat on the test. So that's pretty good. So what I discovered again and again in all the stories that I was reading is that it turns out that a lot of why we behave badly isn't because we're evil, but because we're really skilled at rationalizing our behaviors and telling ourselves that we're being good. Research into the psychology of even torturers and mass murderers suggests that very few, almost none, are actually just delighting in harming other people. We see that idea of purely evil, sadistic killers on TV, but that's just not what is really playing out most of the time. Instead, the evidence suggests that we're very good at telling ourselves a story that begins, what I'm doing is fair because because I'm a victim, because other people do it too, because that person deserves it. Again, it may be a good story. Um, it may be a very poor story, but what's important is that we believe it. Studies find that the vast majority of us think that we're more moral than the average person. You may be thinking that the biases that I've been discussing explain other people's bad behaviors, but you're too clever or too well informed for them. Um, unfortunately, people with more formal education show more of these biases, not fewer. And that seems to largely be because they've got more material to draw from. So whatever I want to believe or whatever course of action I want to rationalize taking, if I'm bright and creative enough, I can spin the evidence to appear to support it. And I can find ways to poke holes in the evidence uh, that I don't want to believe in. And the more certain that we are that we're being moral, the more firmly convinced, the more we'll rationalize harming others who oppose us. Researchers have called this one the dark side of moral conviction. I think we all need to take note of this because whatever our political views, many of us are quite certain about them, oftentimes more uh, certain than we're justified in being. When we feel so sure that we're fighting for the right cause, that can actually get very dangerous. So what works? Remember I said that there was a study that had found a way to get people to tone down their Islamophobia. Um, and here's the finding. The fuel of the ration, rationalization that we've been talking about is ambiguity. So get people to publicly commit to a specific answer or get them to commit to specific values to define what fair is. Get them to define the rules of the game. Here's an example of what that looks like in practice. Um, so the researchers got participants to first commit to an answer to remove the ambiguity, to make it more uncomfortable and more obviously inconsistent to be rationalizing Islamophobia. So they would answer, uh, participants would answer questions like this. On June 17th, 2015, Dylan Roof entered the Emmanuel African Methodist Episcopal uh, Church and during a prayer service killed nine African American parishioners. Roof cited his white identity as a motivation for the attacks. How responsible do you think you are for the acts of Dylan Roof? How responsible do you think white Americans are for the acts of Dylan Roof? Participants here would say, that neither they nor white Americans were responsible. Then later they were asked questions like this. Muniba is a Muslim who owns a small bakery in Southern France. How responsible do you think Muniba is for the Paris attacks? Referring to attacks that had just happened at the time of the study um, with Desh claiming responsibility. When answering questions to first remove the ambiguity, to define the rules of when someone can be blamed for something and when they can't, people were 50% less inclined to blame all Muslims for the acts of Daesh. And people were much less likely to sign an Islamophobic petition. The researchers found that a month later, 
these effects were still holding, even though the study was done in Barcelona. And within that month, there had actually been um, a bombing by Daesh. So people could easily have become more hateful and fearful again. So again, this isn't presenting new evidence. It's simply asking questions. There's one final scientifically tested technique I'd like to share. It's been shown to really help shift entrenched views. People were asked their opinions on all sorts of topics, such as the UN, uh, US imposing sanctions on Iran. Whether they were on the left or the right, people tended to have strong views. Most of us at this point would think to ask an obvious question, which is why? Why do you believe that? But um, as we've just seen, we're really good at rationalizing our views and explaining them in a way that seems to make sense to us. We have some story that we can come up with about why we believe what we believe. The why question in this study did nothing to reduce the intensity of the views. But then the researchers tried a different question. How? So instead of why do you believe that, can you explain how that would work? Asking how questions about sanctions um, yielded immediate results. People tried to explain the details and they quickly faltered. International sanctions, like a great many issues today, are extremely complicated. And most of us just don't know that much about them. We have a gut feeling, or perhaps we have a feeling that people in our group are pro or anti. Uh, sanctions. And so our group identity means that we should also be that way. Um, and then we assume that we understand the situation far better than we actually do. So when we're asked the how question for the details, the mechanism of how something works, uh, and we hear ourselves struggling to explain those details, um, then we have to tone down um, our beliefs. So people didn't start believing the opposite, but they just believed less firmly and they were less likely to donate to a cause that advocated the position they had initially held. Now there's an important caveat in this study. If we don't know the details and this gap in our knowledge is gently exposed to us in this way through asking questions, we might still try to steer the conversation into the moral domain. So we might say, it doesn't matter how sanctions work. Sanctions are just pure evil, and so we can never implement them. It's very hard to argue against that kind of a broad sweeping moral statement because it's not really about facts anymore. So it's not likely your best approach to try to get into those big abstract questions. Move the conversation back to the details and focus on removing the ambiguity on taking away the fuel that people can use to rationalize believing whatever they want to believe. So I'm curious though, what are the specific effects of sanctions? How do sanctions cause those effects? And what are you concerned about with them? If you listen carefully, chances are good that you'll hear some actual concerns and um, some maybe that you weren't even aware of previously. So you might learn something new and you'll also probably hear some confusion and maybe some misinformation that this person has or, or areas where they don't understand the situation. Um, so at this point, it might be helpful to introduce some factual information um, to add to what they've just said. So that's where you can start to bring in um, alternate information, but don't start there, start with the questions. Okay. That's all I had to say for now. I'm going to open it up for questions. I just want to say I work for a very small charity. Um, we did look into uh, different advertising options. So we found out that uh, on Canadian TV, it's called CBC Television. It would cost about $250,000 to run an ad campaign. Um, but we built the book's website and a one minute video promo for 405 bucks. So we don't, we don't have a budget for that. Um, but we do have word of mouth and I'm only here because um, Miles was uh, gracious enough to connect me um, with, with Skip and this group. So um, please, you know, I'm happy to give presentations like this, um, connect with me and spread the word. I think that uh, this is information. These are practical skills that a lot of people who are interested in trying to spread peace um, are looking for right now. 
And uh, the other thing I wanted to talk about is that I'm facilitating online workshops and they are generously supported by our donors. So they're totally free for anyone who's interested. Um, they're capped at only 20 people. So it'll be 20 people or less in the workshop. And so that gives the opportunity for a lot of lively interaction and group discussion. So it's nothing like this. I'm not just talking, it's, it's mostly people interacting and activities that happen. And the workshop series runs for five weeks and it's 90 minutes per week, all via Zoom. And so if you're interested, you can find out more information and register at quakerservice.ca backslash register. You can also connect with me via matt at quakerservice.ca, my email, or on social media at CFSC Quakers. Terrific, man. This has been really a great presentation. Thank you so much for that. And thanks, Miles, for introducing us to him. I'm, I'm really feeling like this is a, an indication of how humanity is moving forward because these are kinds of conversations we weren't able to have like 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think there was a, as much understanding of what separates uh, the right and the left. There's been a lot of people working on these kinds of issues, like Jonathan Haidt, for instance, who has a couple of great TED Talks on, on the difference between liberals and conservatives. And uh, one of my kind of pet uh, areas of interest is in, in nonviolent communication. And I really try to practice these these conversations and it's very, very hard. And I always, uh, when I'm trying to engage somebody I disagree with, I always kind of go back to this, to the kinds of things you're talking about, trying to justify my own opinion and trying to pre present facts. And it's really helpful for me to, to keep rehearsing in my head that curiosity about the other person's position is going to be a lot more effective. I just thank you so much for that. Thanks. I totally agree with you. It's really um, tough to not get into that debate um, mode. And I think we're, we're raised, uh, at least the education system I came from, and I think a lot of people can relate to this comment. Um, you're kind of um, encouraged to show that you're smart by out debating other people and having, you know, piling information at them. But um, it's not a great way to um, engage people, yeah, or, or really change people from their, from their heart. I think what I really learned the most from doing the research for this book is how much what you're feeling in your body right now will change what you're thinking and what you're saying. When I taught religious studies at the University of Nevada, we practiced uh, nonviolent dialogue, religious dialogue, and so I would invite students to come sit in a chair, two students at a time. And what they had to do was to listen to the other person and repeat back to them what they said before they could say what they had to say. And then the other person would do the same. It was amazing how difficult that was to get out of the debate mode into the dialogue mode. Totally agree, yes. Um, it is something that we do. Um, it's, there's activities in the book. So the book has short chapters and activities and it has a, a section on how to facilitate them. So anyone can do this if you have an in-person group, but um, I've been doing them, facilitating them online. And it is something we do in breakout rooms so that people get to practice active listening and also practice communicating, trying to speak clearly so that um, you get to hear, you know, what is it that um, this person got from what I just said? Uh, and it's a, it's a rare opportunity to just hear back what you've said and not a judgment on top of it. Hi, Matt. Uh, well, it's so great, great to see everybody here. Um, just a quick recap or history for me about Quakers, 
um, when I heard, oh, George Fox is a Quaker, I thought, oh, I, I knew he was religious, but I didn't know he was a Quaker. Problem was, I was getting George Fox mixed up with Jeff Foxworthy, the, the uh, comedian. And, uh, and, and George Fox lived in 1600 something, right? <laughs> so he's not to be confused with Jeff Foxworthy. Um, but um, what I uh, was really uh, drawn to was learning of, of the Canadian Friends Service Committee and seeing some of the work they've done uh, right early on and maybe even before what's called the Truth and Reconciliation Commission work here in Canada, which was to address the mistreatment of Indigenous people in Canada. And so um, that was uh, really it continues to be a great source of education for me to learn more about my Indigenous neighbors and also to shape my thinking that, uh, as you said at the outset, uh, Quakers are friends who see the light in everyone, no matter what their original belief system is. And that's really a resonance with what Skip is, is bringing to me as well with the work of Carl Jung. And um, the depth psychology is, as Skip is always saying, you know, God's not up there and God's not down there and neither's the devil. But if we go in, there's a light. And uh, I'm uh, really expanding my appreciation for other cultures and spiritualities, even though I was baptized in a Baptist church. Um, I still hold that reverentially that baptism. However, I, I always felt there's something wrong and, and it's shared among many here that um, there's a, a type of Christianity that I just will say it's you're going to hell Christianity. And there are a lot of people that are literally on the street preaching that. In fact, there's a gentleman who's from a particular non-denominational church who's on a cross Canada tour, basically saying that with a loudspeaker on street corners. And, um, and then when people shout back at him, then there's this fight because, you know, he's basically saying, if you're, uh, you're homosexual, you're going to hell is his message. And people are shouting back, you know, no, you're nuts. And, Anyway, um, I'm not sure whether this gentleman is doing it because he gets a lot of views, because his YouTube videos are uh, quite interesting to watch, you know, because he's creating this fuss on the street and uh, at times, you know, even some violence occurring. Um, but in summary, I guess what I'll just say is that one of the things that really captivating to me is that your faith is friends and Quaker is actually a nickname that your your faith got some centuries ago apparently and uh, at, at the end of it it's um, what Carl Jung and Skip will maybe go into this some more but the concept of Christification is a question we have to ask each of ourselves and um, you know for me it's a uh, is, is the message of the Bible, you're going to hell, or is the message of Christ, be my friend? So um, I appreciate, in summary, what Quakers is all about in, in saying, you know, it's be a friend first and foremost. Thank you. Thanks, Miles. Yeah, um, there is a, there's a really interesting story um, at the near the start of the book that I found from Kenya um, of some truly incredible activists who decided that they wanted to engage with um, ministers who were uh, local ministers and imams who were um, preaching that they should be killed, that gay people should be killed. And it's a really remarkable story. So they reached out to these um, these folks and they invited them to a training seminar about um, HIV AIDS and um, it was just supposed to be educational. 
uh, and they didn't say their identities. And so they got a number of these imams and ministers to come and register. And then after a few uh, months of this training group, once there had been enough rapport built, then they did the big reveal. By the way, these people that you've been engaging with and training with over these past months were actually uh, gay. And the ministers and imams were very shocked. And then they said, do you still wish death on us? And they said, no, well, not you personally, because you know now I know you, but... Um, and so uh, it, it changed a lot of their opinions dramatically and it changed our lives. And that's a powerful and very courageous example of um, what's called contact theory. And there have been hundreds of studies on contact theory and two major meta-analyses of it. And um, it works quite well, not in every single circumstance. So there are times when contact can make things worse rather than better. So um, the specifics of the, of the situation matters a lot. But in a lot of circumstances, just having a relationship with someone who we see as other, then they aren't other anymore. And what you were saying too about social media, about, you know, that it's true, um, controversial content or things that people are shouting and they're violent and et cetera. Uh, there's been studies on this on Twitter feeds, for example, our eyes gravitate like the, the, they can do these studies where they just track eye movement and they can see that people's eyes go to the most controversial or outrageous tweets first um, as they're scrolling through. So it disproportionately gets our attention and like I was saying with neuroscience, you know, the more attention you put on something, you're actually kind of strengthening that habit. So at some point, we can start to be living in a world that we think is much more outrageous and extreme than it, than it might really be because we're focusing so much energy and attention on, on those types of voices. Matt, I just wanted to compliment you on a really great presentation. It was important and relevant in these very trying times. And um, I totally agree with you, you know, um, of, of almost everything that you've, you know, presented here. And <clears throat> being a retired psychiatrist, it's really important, like even uh, when I deal with people and patients, to establish a rapport, a relationship first. And um, that's actually very key because when you look upon a person or um, even try to begin a dialogue, they gotta like you first. And I like you a lot. You can come across <laughs> as a very, very nice, very calm and peaceful and sincere person. And that's important when I listen to information. So your information is well received. So thank you very much. Um, I, I have a, you know, um, favorite saying, happiness is an inside job. Mm -hmm. So I agree with um, Tim, Miles and Skip, you know, that um, the inner God is really important. And we've got to be in touch with that. I believe that one does have to go into a deep spiritual listening, which is that silent spot that we need to connect with before we even open our mouth. So <laughs> thank you um, so much for reminding us that, you know, simplicity, peace, integrity, community, equality, and unity with uh, creator and creation is extremely important and we have to keep those um, points and values in the forefront. So again, thank you. A question though, how is it that you came into this um, focus? Because you put tremendous amount of focus in this. Um, where did you receive it? Is it from your childhood background or um, something happened to you uh, along your, your life's journey? Thank you. Thanks so much for that. Um, I have been in a really fortunate place here at Canadian Friends Service Committee to learn from some amazing different people. And um, I, was, uh, I was frustrated that there wasn't um, more way to get this kind of what I was hearing to a wider audience. So I think that was a big motivation. 
I also did sincerely want to try to test it, interrogate it, see if it was right, see if I could find evidence that said it didn't work the way that I was being told. Um, so I, I was very curious about a lot of these things I was hearing. And um, the opportunity just presented itself. And interestingly, it was kind of funny. They asked me to write a 50 page pamphlet in initially, and it later turned into you know, a full 350 page book um, with exercises. Uh, so it's not all kind of dense content and there's stories and stuff and pictures. Um, but yeah, it took, it's it, um, expanded a lot more than, than I thought it was going to. So um, once you get started on a piece of work like this, you kind of, everything connects into it. So it's just about drawing lines somewhere and figuring out. I mean, the toughest thing was really figuring out how to create a linear flow for the narrative because a book is linear or hierarchical. Something has to come first and second and third, but reality is not, it's all interconnected. So um, figuring out a way to do that where things weren't really too repetitive and it kind of was systematic was, was the toughest part. And hopefully I got there for the most part, but I don't know. Um, and now I'm just having the opportunity to talk to a whole bunch of different groups and facilitate groups and uh, that's been wonderful. So uh, I feel very fortunate to be doing this work and it was also a major, major project. And if I knew what I was getting into, I never would have got started, so. Terrific job, great. You're doing great. service to mankind, thank you. Thank you. So I've got a question for you, Matt. Yeah. Toward the end of your presentation, you put up a graphic that said ambiguity works. And the way I understood what you said was if you can if you can dive into that ambiguity and try to specify what how a person feels a an outcome can be achieved, that's what works. And so that did I get that right? It just seemed like a like a strange uh, slide to say ambiguity works. Yeah, sorry, the slide was um, that ambiguity is the, is the fuel of a lot of the kind of rationalizing whatever we want to think and believe. Um, so very few of us are going to wake up in the morning and say, I, I want to be evil today. Um, I think most of us think that what we're doing is the right thing to be doing. Um, and the way that we do that is through um, this ambiguity of not defining what the right thing means in a consistent way. So in different situations, we use different standards. And when we're judging someone else, we use a different standard from when we're judging ourselves and so on. Okay, that makes perfect sense to me. Thank you. One of the things that we've been talking about um, right along is this idea of... Um, in Christianity, the idea of the paraclete, which is the Holy Ghost. And, um, you know, Christ said uh, that he had to go so that the paraclete could come. Um, and it takes a while to understand what that means. But, um, but Dr. Young did some informal study uh, by asking uh, theologians, Catholic theologians, and so on, whether uh, they were following that teaching. And they said, no, nah, we don't do much with the paraclete. And mainly, it seems that they, they didn't want people to um, understand that it was about having the Holy Ghost within them. And, uh, and, you know, as long as there's a, as long as there's a, um, you know, a charismatic leader uh, like Martin Luther King or John Lewis or um, the no notorious RBG, um, everybody looks to them for the leadership. But when they leave us, then we have to uh, manifest what they've taught us uh, from ourselves. And, um, and so um, 
I happen to have because I was talking about it this morning from from uh, Edinger's uh, Ion Lectures, a quote here um, that should resonate with a Quaker. It says, um, as it gradually dawns on people one by one that the transformation of God is not just an interesting idea, but is a living reality, it may begin to function as a new myth. Um, Whoever recognizes this myth as his own personal reality will put his life in the service of this process. Such an individual offers himself as a vessel for the infer incarnation of deity and thereby promotes the ongoing transformation of God by giving him human manifestation. Such an individual will experience his life as meaningful and will be an example of Jung's statement, quote, the indwelling of the Holy Ghost, the third divine person in man, brings about the Christification of many, unquote. And so the point being obviously that um, the same point as the Quakers, that we all have a piece of God within us and and we have to decide, you know, what God expects and wants. And the, as I actually said this morning, um, we don't normally decide for the bad. Okay, if we if we look at human, uh, if we look at human consciousness and behavior across. Uh, the species, if you look, if anybody who's watching this just looks around in their room, uh, there's nothing in your room that you didn't think was good when you selected it. Um, and if you have something that you think is bad in your room, probably you ought to take it out to the dumpster today. <laughs> but, but the point is, we all uh, try to decide for the good. And um, you know, we, we're sort of um, flash banged by um, our cable news networks, which grab our attention and, and many people are, are uh, you know, just totally um, hypnotized by, by some network, whatever that network is. And they make it sound like everybody in the United States right now, because we have an election going on, they make, make it sound like we're at each other's throats. But if we just turn that off, which we should do anyway, and just go to the grocery store, we, we see that we're getting along perfectly well in most cases, 99.9% .9 of the time uh, that, that there are people of all races, creeds, um, religions, et cetera, all shopping at the grocery store. We're doing it peacefully and we're, we're respecting our fellow Americans regardless of their background. So, um, you know, that, that's something that we have to look at and understand that we're all deciding for the good. Um, and, um, you know, over, Millennia, it, it gradually shows more and more in the human species, but it takes a long time sometimes. Um, before I ask my question, let me ask if you have any comment about anything I've said there. Uh, just the, to the last piece, there is some very interesting research on this from the US. So if you ask people on the left or on the right, they um, drastically overestimate how far the other side is from what they believe. Um, so there's actually a lot of overlap, even on controversial issues like gun control, yeah. um, like healthcare, like policing. Um, but there is an, a misunderstanding that the other side is much more extreme than they actually are. And a more recent study that just came out found that there's also the sense that the other side is dehumanizing you that they dislike you and that they disagree with you much more than they actually do. Yeah. So um, there is a, a real sense of being under threat much more than is real, but it doesn't matter because the sense itself uh, has real repercussions. Yeah. 
and it, and it's driven by this idea of of being harangued by media, whatever it is, on specific issues. Um, so I I have a I have one question. Maybe this isn't a fair question, but um, let's see how it works out. Uh, so last night, uh, or two nights ago, Ruth Bader Ginsburg died. And she, of course, was a very polarizing figure in some ways. I, I'm not sure how familiar you are with her because you're Canadian, not American. But, but obviously, she, she was a believer in civil rights, a believer in women's rights and human rights generally. And it's clear that both sides in our political um, fray are trying to use this as a, as a lightning rod for their followers to gin up their support. And so the question is, how, how do you deal with that when you know that you know, two sides are going to use this one thing as a lightning rod and either you know, say that she's horrible or she was a saint? Um, and um, how, do you, how do you diffuse that? Yeah. Um... There's, there's some good research about how journalists can do this kind of a thing. I think they have a particular role to play here. Um, and there is something called the Solutions Journalism Network that is teaching these kind of skills to journalists. Mm -hmm. um, but essentially, most conflicts are covered in a way where it's one side says this, the other side says the opposite, and now they have to battle for supremacy. So it's a two-sided battle for supremacy. Mm -hmm. um, that is really not a helpful framing. It doesn't help you to understand the conflict better. It doesn't help you to um, have a realistic feel about the situation, but it sounds kind of objective because the media can then quote one source from either side and then it seems like they were balanced, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so one thing that journalists can do is they can start asking different questions. So one of the questions with any conflict situation is, um, you know, what what is being done towards a, a successful resolution of this? So if people disagree about, um, you know, Ruth Bader Ginsburg's legacy, um, what points of, of um, commonality are there between them rather than just amplifying the points of disagreement? Let's ask that question. And I bet there's a lot of overlap. Um, there may not be. I don't know uh, too much about the specifics of her uh, legacy. And um, so from there, um, you can also ask, what don't you know? What don't you know? So there you're trying to raise up the, the fact of continued uncertainty. Um, and there are, I'm sure, a lot of decisions that she made that it's not really clear yet exactly what the implications are. Uh, and some of the implications, you know, there can be unintended harms, even if she had the best of intentions in her decisions, right? That always happens. Um, sure. So with any policy, with any decision that's made that it affects a lot of people, you can find ways that it benefited some people and ways that it harmed some other people. That's always going to be the case. So I think one thing that um, media does when they tend to want to polarize is they, they cherry pick um, outlier cases or extreme cases, and they raise them up as though they were the norm. And that, um, you know, really distorts our view about reality. So, so th those are a couple of ways to try to push back on that. And I know that there are some groups who are doing that work within the US. Um, and uh, so it's not impossible, but unfortunately, it's not as attention grabbing, and it's not as sensationalized, and it doesn't have the big money behind it that some of the other media does. Yeah. Okay, that's very interesting. When when is your next uh, online program that isn't full? <laughs> yeah, so we have one starting on Tuesday that's full, but we are gonna we have about five more people registered. So once we pass about ten or fifteen, I will um, announce a day. And so when you register, you can just say what days or times um, work for you or don't work for you, and we will um, do our very best to make sure that we get a time that works for everyone and. Um, and we'll run the session. I see. Okay, that's good to know. 
Um, I've got another question. Um, go ahead, Miles. So, Matt, you uh, studied social psychology, and very recently I heard uh, William, I think it's William J. Perry, former Secretary of Defense of the United States, uh, who participated uh, in the 90s uh, to work with the Russians to dismantle thousands of nuclear weapons. And very recently he was interviewed and he was asked, well, you know, why do we have nuclear weapons in the first place? And he replied, uh, well, that's a difficult question. It's psychological. I'm wondering how much do you know with respect to the work of Carl Jung, Jungian psychology? And um, his, uh, I'll just summarize and then let you answer that question, then Skip can jump in. But his work was in consciousness, and Skip really defined it well for me anyway. And consciousness means con with science, con meaning with, and science is thinking. So being in consciousness is the state of thinking with withness. Now, recently, he had a terrific interview with a, a Jungian psychologist, Professor Becca Tarnas. And she was saying, well, I think we actually need a better word than consciousness. And I asked Skip, you know, like, I don't want to give up on this word consciousness. I've just recently fell in love with it. But now I'm being told it's maybe not as good a word as we could have. And Skip answered. So I said, well, what's the what's a better word for um, consciousness? And Skip immediately replied, individuation. And I'm wondering if you're familiar with that word. Maybe Skip can elaborate on that, too. Yeah, um, I, I read two books by Jung, and he was the subject of uh, one of the courses that I took in university quite a bit. So I know a little bit about it, and I definitely um, am familiar with the term individuation, but I wouldn't claim any type of expertise at all, uh, or, you know, very deep level of knowledge about Jung. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I totally agree with the point about um, you know, where we're coming from, influencing the work that we do, whether it's science, whether it's anything else. And so there's a couple chapters in this book on inner peace. And I think that it's a super important topic and one that is very easy to ignore in a culture that is um, very driven and very externally focused and very immediate reward focused and all kinds of other things. Um, so I can't say that I, um, I can't say that I feel like I have, like I would succeed at, at some of those tips that are in there, but um, I think it's, it's very powerful to think about how the intention and the consciousness that you're bringing to your work, um, you know, is influencing what you're paying attention to, what you're ignoring, how you're treating other people, and how decisions are made as a result. I, I just saw so many examples of the process of working through a conflict. Um, working, you know, being the important factor. And I think a lot of groups who are concerned about social justice are just so concerned about pushing forward toward a specific result that they've already determined that they lose track of that uh, to their own detriment and sometimes wind up harming themselves and their own members in that process. Yeah, uh, just uh, one clarification, Miles, when, when we're talking about con science, that's really, the, I think you've conflated two ideas. One is conscience and one is consciousness, conscious. And conscious relates to awareness. Um, and I, I think one of the, obviously conscious, both conscience and conscious are important, but Dr. Jung's point was that if you make things conscious, then you can reflect on them and then that can be affected by conscience. And I think that's kind of Matt's teaching here, which is that uh, if instead of just butting heads all the time, which is what a lot of Americans want to do, um, we become conscious of the issues that divide us more, then we can reflect on them more and see how they really 
how important they really are. I mean, to the, you know, going back to my point about the, the grocery store, I mean, we can watch our cable news all night long and get ourselves pretty darn worked up. But then uh, if we just go out and look at our society, you know, it's basically peaceful. I mean, our, our president wants to make, make it seem like we have civil war going on right now, but that's not the case at all. Um, you know, we have some demonstrations that are, that are quite valid for uh, various reasons, but, um, you know, except for some criminals who are committing looting and that sort of thing, which is not so common anymore. Um, I think, you know, we relatively have a peaceful country right now. I mean, okay, there, there were some demonstrations in, in um, Portland, but the president brought in rent-a-cops basically who haven't even sworn an oath to uh, support the constitution of the United States. They're, they're actually hired people. <laughs> That's what those uniformed guys were. They were, they were contractors to the U.S. government, but they have no commitment to uh, our country, and we have to be conscious of that. And so then if we think about it, if, we're, if we then become conscious of that fact that these guys aren't guys who swore an oath to the country, but are guys who uh, swore an oath to get a paycheck, <laughs> uh, then maybe their, their motivations aren't so pure. And when they're attacking people with tear gas, maybe they're actually out there just trying to drum up more conflict to make it seem like we have more conflict than we do. But compared to the 1960s, we have nothing compared to the 1960s. I mean, in, in the 1960s, we uh, destroyed a major part of Washington, D.C. And, you know, if you come, um, and this is after the Martin Luther King and Robert F. Kennedy murders, um, you know, a major part of D.C. was destroyed. And, and if you come to Washington, I'll be happy to show you places where that still hasn't been repaired, okay, where there are still, there's still damage uh, that shows uh, on our buildings from that time. But compared to that time, uh, this time is quite peaceful, actually. Um, and, uh, and so we just have to make ourselves aware of what, what the reality is. And that includes, you know, going to the grocery store, looking around, seeing what your fellow Americans are doing. And, you know, there's some people in hijabs and there are some black guys in hoodies and so on, but they're going about their business. <laughs> you know, they're, not, they're not threatening your life in any way. I guess what I was really just wanting to bring to the table was that we've got to look at, at things with more than just the thinking function. Yeah, and absolutely. Young, you know, said the intuition is an important function, emotion is an important function, and uh, and and sensing uh, all the senses in in addition to thinking. Yeah. Um... I mean, I, the abortion debate is one that's quite sensitive, of course, um, and I have a serious disagreement with, with at least one of my daughters on this issue. I haven't discussed it with two of the others, but uh, it did come up between me and one of my daughters and her husband on one occasion, and we... Uh, argued our points for about an hour. And then I said, uh, I'm sorry, I'm not going to discuss this with you anymore because um, you're my family. And if we keep arguing about this, it's going to destroy our relationship as, as father and daughter. And, and we, we can't do that. 
And so we're simply going to agree to disagree on this point. And, um, and that's worked out, um, you know, over the, over the years um, that, you know, we don't necessarily agree on that point. And, you know, in, in some senses, I agree with her. I mean, for example, um, I agree that abortion is horrible and I wouldn't wish it on any woman uh, to have an abortion, but I, I don't deny that there are occasions when it's appropriate. <laughs> and, and so, um, or that someone can choose that it's, a, it's important uh, and, and appropriate. Um, you know, and, and, uh, you know, so, um, it's, it's a very, these are very hard issues, but, um, you know, I can be against abortion, but still in favor of it being legal in this country. And, I uh, you on this, because I feel like Amer a lot of Americans, they have this, they, they live in very comfortable situation. So they have this ideal way of seeing life. They don't mm. understand hard, hardship for some of the people. And they like to use their moral standard as like superior standard to like, like human right. You know, they want every country to follow American, but they don't understand how, what the situation in other country is. So I don't really like the way some people have this superior moral, like feelings. <laughs> like they, Holier they, than thou. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty right immature in some way. Yeah. Um. Yeah, that brings up an interesting um, topic of perspective taking. Um, so there's some interesting research on perspective taking, which is when you try to imagine the perspective of someone else. And what they find in, um, in US culture is that if you're, uh, let's say, um, a white person, you know, majority person in the culture, and you take the perspective of a minority person, you actually learn a fair bit from that. And, and it changes your, your worldview to some extent for at least a little bit. Um, but if you're a minority person and you take the majority view, it doesn't do very much for you because you're getting that already from media and TV and everywhere. So, um, so perspective taking, uh, it's difficult to get people in a, in a more powerful uh, mainstream, whatever position to take the perspectives that they don't need to take because they don't need to take it. It's not part of their day-to-day -day routine to have to take it. Right. Um, but when they do, uh, that can, that can um, expand their understanding and hopefully um, also increase some degree of empathy for um, people in different situations from themselves. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, hey, Matt, I've got to go here, but I really want to thank you for being here. Um, this has been such a great uh, discussion, and I wish we had more people involved because this really needs to be a nationwide discussion, particularly for the U.S. at this yeah. time in our, and in our just electoral be, process. Just before you go, Tim, I, I have a procedural issue to ask you, which relates to that which is I've been trying to get word out on these things and I switched to MailChimp. And the other day, um, the other day, uh, Miles pointed out to me that these MailChimp messages are now getting shunted off to promotions on Gmail. And so I'm wondering, ha has everybody gotten the MailChimp message that I sent yesterday? You did get it. Tim did, and and Meritus has gotten it, but was who who didn't hear about it until ten minutes before this session when I sent it out a second time just to the advanced reading group. Uh, yeah, I got the later email. You got the message just this morning, just today. Yeah. Okay, so so you didn't see the Mailchimp message. No. Mm, okay, so it may be in. What does a Mailchimp message look like different well, from other messages? Well, it 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 will come across, and it looks like it's it's spam. In fact, I got 
one message from you once that had that on it, Nancy, uh, which, you know, it comes up with a big yellow warning, you know, is this message okay? And you have to consciously hit, um, hit yes. And, uh, and Annette here is saying on the YouTube chat that she got only the later email and she didn't see the MailChimp message. So I'm not very happy about that functionality if that's what they're, what's happening here. I think maybe you just have to, for now, maybe try just telling people, be aware your mail, these messages may be going to your promotions, Gmail, in, but not your primary inbox. Right. Like I, I don't know if everybody's got Gmail, but you have three categories. Mm -hmm. the mail gets distributed to i got a it's a social media alerts in, yep. in, inbox there's a promotions inbox and i don't go to the promotions that often i just happen to see yeah it. i i never go to it so so uh you know that would explain why we haven't gotten much information else. i was also having trouble getting in today i don't know if that is happening to other people but um, getting into zoom and Okay, that I don't anyway, know about. Do you, you, it took me was several it? times. I don't know what was going on, but it would, it would say, know. you know, wait for something and nothing would happen. But I eventually got here. So, you know. yeah. I'd like to ask Matt a question or yeah, go ahead, Matt. share go ahead. a difficulty. Well, I was embarrassed the other day at my behavior. I try to think of myself as a listener and, and broad minded, but a friend on Facebook posted a very inflammatory statement. And before I even thought about it, I reacted and sent a very sarcastic mass message back. It's almost like it was instinctual. Can you uh, respond to that? Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. Um, it's, uh, I think social media is designed for that in some ways, um, encouraging instinctual responses. Um, but uh, yeah, you find that in, in other situations in, in the real world. So um, there's a chapter in the book that looks at, at that in some depth about snapping, um, violent snapping, like happens for instance in road rage incidents. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, there, there are neuroscience reasons for that, but basically what can be done about it is to try to um, engage your um, thinking self, uh, engage the prefrontal cortex more. And so um, aspects of that might be something like singing a song to yourself, um, <laughs> taking a pause, and it's best to do these types of things um, repeatedly, like, you know, if, if uh, there are certain triggers that you notice that you're responding to, um, to try to um, train yourself on them, uh, on not responding to them or responding the way you would like to. So basically exactly what Skip was talking about earlier about um, making things more conscient, conscious and less uh, kind of unconscious or reactive. And um, yeah, there is, uh, thankfully, there are some programs that are successful in that regard to a degree, but it's it's pretty amazing. I mean, some of the stories I found are people middle aged, no history of violence, just suddenly snap and, uh, you know, have a really brutal road rage incident because someone cut them off, for example. Right. I, I used to joke to friends when I would pick people up at Narita Airport in Tokyo when I was living in Japan. And it would be like a three hour drive from Narita Airport into Tokyo, very slow. I mean, like a five mile an hour type of pace. And I would just joke to people, uh, geez, if this was Texas, there would be shootings. <laughs> <You know? laughs> just because of that. Well, Matt, I want to put your, your book cover back up on the on the uh, screen so people can know again um, the name of your book. Is your book available also on Amazon? Yep, it's available uh, Amazon from the publisher. There's a bunch of basically anywhere. It's also an audio book and an ebook and Kindle, all those things. Okay, wonderful. Um, 
And so I'm going to put it back up on the screen. Is there anything else that you wanted to say to us before we before I do that? And then I'll terminate the session after I've Please promoted your book you again. For coming, yeah. And yeah, and, and I will put the link uh, to the registration for your program um, in the description of this uh, session so that in playback people will be able to find it in the description. But I want to personally thank Miles for suggesting this session and and thank you Matt, Matt for uh, giving it to us because uh, it's been a profound session and uh, we appreciate it very much. And uh, Nilzo, did you want to say something earlier? It looked like Nilsa was going to say something, but no, no, I'm fine. Thank uh, you. Okay, well, well welcome. Uh, I don't know that I've seen you in our group before, but I, you're certainly welcome here. And, um, and so I, I'm kind of learning everything. I'm a graduate student, so. Okay, and in psychology, are you? Or? Yes, counseling psychology. Okay, uh, that's. Uh, that's a big job. So yeah, <laughs> but very involved with the union. So ah, well, that's great. So yeah. there's there's lots here on this YouTube channel about that. Uh, I don't know if you saw it, but um, the black books are going to be released next month. Yes, uh, on the thirteenth of October, and you can. Uh, I saw that the price has gone down, uh, and. And so that's a good sign. Uh, <laughs> I think I think they were originally going to have eight volumes, and now there are only seven volumes. And so the price is down to two hundred and seventy dollars for the seven volumes. But um, I, I'm very much looking forward to that. And yeah. every everybody can pre-order pre-order the black books uh, on Amazon. Um, they cost 270 though, just so you're warned. But you're getting seven books for that. And they're in a boxed set, so that's very good. So I will uh, now uh, share my screen again to uh, show Matt's uh, book. And so Matt, thank you so much. And uh, we'll, we'll find a way to be in touch again in the future because I very much appreciate it having uh, interaction with you on these things. So talk to you soon. Um, so here is uh, Matt's book and I'll leave this up for a few seconds so everybody can be sure to get the name of it and uh, to see the book that we're talking about because it's obvious that we all need to find ways to work to be better uh, in ourselves um, and uh, so anyway, uh, it's been great to have you here today and we'll see you again soon, Matt. And I will now discontinue the session and, and we'll Thank you. see you all again soon. Bye-bye.